My name is Sarah Carr. I'm a coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Um, and we also have Nick Weiner from Open Channels and uh, here today. And we're, we're very pleased to welcome you here today. Um, our speakers today are going to be Rebecca Love and Nate Harold with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. And they're going to be speaking today about land cover products for understanding water quality impacts. Um, I'll turn it over to them in just a minute, but before we do that, um, I'd like to let everyone know how you can ask questions. At the end of the presentation, we'll have dedicated time for question and answer. Um, you can ask questions by sending in, typing the question into the, the question panel of the user interface, um, and then either Nick or I will relay it to the speakers. Um, and you can send those questions in throughout the presentation or at the end, we'll, uh, if there's just a quick clarifying question, we may ask the speakers during the presentation, but most of the questions will hold question and answer period at the end. Um, but you can send them in any time. Um, or you can raise your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon in the user interface. You can raise your virtual hand, we'll unmute you, and you can ask the question directly to uh, Nate and Rebecca. Um, this option only works if you have a working microphone, if you're using your um, the computer uh, audio, or if you're, using, you're calling in on the telephone if you've entered the PIN number. Um, so we welcome questions of, uh, during the webinar by typing them in and at the end um, through both uh, raising your virtual hand or typing them in. So anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, back to uh, Nate and Rebecca. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about NOAA's land cover program and several related products and how those products can be used to help screen for and plan around potential impacts due to water quality. Um, before we get into the meat of the presentation, I'd like to just give you a little bit of an outline of, of where that presentation will go. Um, we'll give you a, a very brief introduction on who we are, uh, and then we'll jump right into giving you an overview of NOAA's land cover monitoring program. That'll include both an overview of a regional as well as a high resolution set of product lines that are produced as part of the mapping that we do. Then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about how we take that data that we produce and try to help turn it into more meaningful information. As part of that, I'll give a, a brief overview or demonstration of our online land cover atlas tool. And then I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca who will talk to you a little bit more about uh, NOAA's Digital Coast effort and our website as well as a map-based how-to that we've produced that walks users through some key land cover indicators that relate to water quality information. And then, of course, at the end, we'll have some time for questions, answers, and follow-on discussion. So both Rebecca and I are with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, or OCM. This office is the federal lead for all activities related to coastal management includes things like the National Coastal Zone Management Program, the Coral Reef Conservation Program, the National Estuarine Research Reserve System, and NOAA's Digital Coast. We're both located in Charleston, South Carolina, though OCM has multiple regional offices throughout the U.S. I'm a physical scientist with NOAA. I'm in charge of leading NOAA's land cover mapping activities. Uh, which is essentially what we're going to jump into right now. So NOAA's land cover mapping activities are, are primarily housed within its Coastal Change Analysis Program, or CCAP. If you're not familiar with CCAP, it's an inventory of intertidal areas, wetlands, and adjacent uplands that is designed to improve the understanding of the linkages between land use and the changes that occur as they relate to coastal environments. We really hang our hat on the fact that we produce consistent and accurate products. We do that through the use of standard data and methods. And I'll note that uh, we are recognized as being a, an authoritative source by the FGDC for land cover data in the coastal portions of the U.S. Now CCAP has two main product lines. Uh, the first and the one that we'll spend most of our time talking about we refer to as our regional land cover and change product line. With those products, we map all the areas that are highlighted here in blue. Uh, this is about 25% of the contiguous U.S. Uh, these products are all based on Landsat imagery, 
uh, mapped at 30 meter pixels uh, or approximately quarter acre uh, raster cells. The products that we produce here are updated every five years. Uh, all of these areas have data that goes back to at least 1996 and is updated every five years after that. Some areas go back further, but we have at least 1996 everywhere that you see here. And it might be important to note that we produce these products through a process of change detection, meaning that we detect the areas that change between our different time periods, and then update mapping so that we only map those areas. And that's kind of an important distinction because it allows us to produce these products faster and cheaper, but it also allows us to have a very consistent time series of products because by not mapping the areas that haven't changed, we're keeping those products very consistent and not changing what the land cover call might be in those areas because a different person might be interpreting them, we have different algorithms using them, or different contract companies that may be responsible for the work. And I will note two, two things here. Um, one is that the areas that you see in blue here probably go a bit further inland than what most folks think of when they think of coastal. And there's an important reason for that. Um, we really want to capture not only the, the most immediately coastal areas, but all those areas that are upstream and that drain into coastal areas and have direct impact both in terms of their, their current land use as well as the changes that we see through time. And the second thing that I'll note is that while we don't map the entire U.S., we do coordinate very closely with all the other federal agencies that do mapping on a national level, and all the data that we produce in these areas are directly incorporated into the national land cover database um, and, and the products that the USGS produces for the country, so that while we have our own data that actually adds a little bit of detail in terms of some of the wetlands that we map, those activities are very closely coordinated and work in unison with the other federal programs in order to produce one national standardized data set for the country. Now I mentioned that we do map a little bit more detail in terms of the wetland categories that we map. Here you can see all the categories that we mapped kind of grouped in terms of their, their hierarchy. Uh, the coastal land covers that I've highlighted here in blue those are the categories where we go and map a little bit more detail than you might find in those NLCD products for the rest of the country. And so you can see we, we break out the woody and the herbaceous wetlands to a, a little bit finer detail by mapping both forest and shrub and the woody categories, as well as the, the palustrian versus estuarine breaks uh, in all the wetland environments that we map. We also spend a little bit more time mapping those wetlands. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this slide, but I will note that as part of the 2010 update um, that we completed several years ago, we did consent, spend considerable time modeling and resetting the wetlands that CCAP mapped in our products. Uh, we took a lot of nationally available data sets, assembled those data layers together to create a wetland potential surface and then we used those surfaces to help us correct some of the areas that maybe should not have been wet that we had previously mapped as being wetland or vice versa, some of the areas that had been upland previously in our data sets but uh, very likely should have been captured as, as wetlands previously. And we think that's been a great improvement uh, both in that 2010 product but we also pushed those improvements back through all of the dates of our existing data as well. And so just to kind of give you a little bit of an illustration both about how we produce the data as well as what you might get if you came and downloaded some of our data sets, um, here you can see three examples. Uh, starting on the far left, we have one of our 2005 land cover products. Uh, this is actually one of our high-res products, which I'll get to in a little bit, but the illustration holds true for all, for all of our products. Um, in the middle, you see the areas of change between 2005 and 2011. And then on the far right, you see the subsequent new 2011 land cover product. And so this speaks to what I mentioned earlier in that we go in, detect these areas of change, update the mapping for these areas, and then lay that product over the unchanged areas to create a new wall-to-wall -wall surface. And so this kind of gives you a little bit of an illustration both as to how we produce those products and the types of information that we serve. Because you could come into our Digital Coast website download either of those individual dates of land cover or the actual change file that highlights what the area had been previously and what it changed to. 
which is just a wealth of information. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking to what it is that we've seen in the time period where we've been producing CCAP data. Uh, from 1996 to 2010 nationally, we saw about 65,000 square miles of change. Uh, that's a little bit more than 8.5% of that coastal area that I mentioned changing at least one time. Uh, a lot of that change really has to do with forest management and the civiculture cycle of cutting and regrowth that you see in those areas, which you can kind of tell here from some of the bar chart information. And it makes sense as you look uh, across the different regions that we map and understanding the southeast and the northern part of the Gulf has a lot of those activities um, that take place in them. So they account for, in some ways, more than their fair share of change. One important item I will note here is that the rate of change that we see in these coastal areas is about double that that the NLCD products have seen for the rest of the U.S. And so while we map less than half of the area of the country, we map about 25%, uh, we map almost 44% of all the changes that have been occurring in those areas. And so while it's uh, not, not the largest of, of areas, it is fairly challenging in terms of what it is that we have to deal with. During that same time period, we saw uh, around 5,726 square miles of new developed area added into that coastal zone. Um, a lot of this area came from former agriculture fields and forestry areas. Uh, and as you can see, there was a fairly well uh, evenly distributed um, distribution to those changes that we saw throughout the U.S. And finally, we saw a little bit more than 1,500 square miles of wetland loss during this time, mostly in the freshwater forested wetlands. Most of that went to development and uh, some areas of her more herbaceous wetlands changed to open water. And again, primarily in the Gulf and the Southeast, both because those areas uh, experience a lot of the same forestry kinds of changes, but also because they were growing faster during this time period. And I'll point out that for folks who are interested in kind of diving in a little bit deeper to some of the information that we've seen in our data sets from, from 1996 to 2010, we have a series of regional reports that are available on our website. Uh, and you can go into the Digital Coast uh, and access those. We have several different regions available. I'll open up one just so you can kind of get an idea of what it is that that, that report looks like and page down a few times so you can get a feel for some of the information. Here we, we show a distribution of what the land cover looks like in 2010, both in terms of a map as well as some graphics. Uh, and then the areas of change that occurred between 1996. And so you can see both the different types of land cover that changed and where those changes occurred in the southeast in, in this instance. And I'll just notice that, uh, or note that we also have uh, on that website a link to uh, ArcGIS Online where we have a little bit more interactive story map version of each of those reports. So folks who may want to go in and kind of click in and zoom around to their own area can certainly go ahead and, and do that. Now I mentioned we have two main product lines. We just spent a couple of minutes talking about our regional land cover. The other main product line that we have is, is our high resolution land cover product line. And this is a, a more detailed counterpart to those regional products, um, where the, the regional products are produced from satellite imagery at a 30 meter resolution. The high res product line is produced from aerial imagery and LIDAR data. And it's typically produced at a one meter to two and a half meter level of detail. Uh, so you can understand we, we don't necessarily produce that product everywhere because it's more expensive to produce because it does have a lot more detail. Um, but we do map areas of hot spots in terms of where there may be partner driven needs and folks that we can work with uh, as well as some key types of changes that may be occurring. Typically these products are produced in partnership with someone, more often uh, where there's a cost share kind of relationship where we contribute some of the, the cost of the development and that partner contributes some cost. 
We don't always produce change. A lot of that's based on the partner need. Um, but we do have some change products available. We've kind of made, NOAA has kind of made a, a systematic decision that the islands in the Pacific, Hawaii, Guam, American Samoa, the Northern Marianas, as well as the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, uh, really would benefit from a higher resolution data set. And we've done at least a couple of dates on several of those, those island territories. And I'll just note that uh, we do produce these products through an object-based classification. Uh, I'll give an example of that in just, just a second. And so I mentioned the level of detail that exists in these products. This is just a quick comparison of uh, one area of our 30-meter data compared to a same area that we produced using those high-resolution imagery and methods. And so you can see while the general trend of a lot of that mapping comes out, there's just a much finer level of spatial detail in those high-resolution products where everything kind of gets called a, a general developed category in the 30-meter products. We see streets and houses and individual um, groupings of trees inside those developed areas that show up in those higher resolution products. And I mentioned that we produce those through object-based classification. This is just an example here that shows you uh, in an, for an area of salt marsh in southern Maine, our resulting land cover on the left compared to the imagery and those image objects on the right. And so you can see kind of how the level of detail follows the polygons that are derived from that imagery and other ancillary data and what that translates into in terms of detail in the land cover products. And just to kind of give you an idea of how that might compare to some more traditional manually derived um, products, on the left we, we have a, an older existing map that was derived through pretty standard uh, photo interpretation, manually derived products where somebody had to go in and manually delineate all of those features. Uh, the imagery is in the middle and our classification there is on the far right and you can see you know, just the, the, the sheer volume of kind of greater detail in terms of that line work that's able to be derived by utilizing those image objects over um, what might be realistically expected over somebody having to draw a lot of that line work by hand. And similarly, because you're able to, to take advantage of some of that semi-automation in the production model that we, we use, um, typically we're able to cover much more area than we would through um, a, more of those manual means. Uh, that the manual means are a lot more labor intensive and by utilizing some of these more automated processes and being able to move through that process, we're able to actually cover much more area in the same amount of time or for the same cost. So now I'm going to transition a little bit from just talking about the data that we produce and while we do spend a lot of time producing that data to make sure that it's accurate and useful as possible, um, I want to talk a little bit about turning that data into more meaningful information. We want to make sure that the, the data is, is used, not just that it's useful. Uh, this often means that we need to help folks in terms of making sense or translating the change that can be pulled from our data sets or in working to produce some more customized products that may be focused around specific issue areas. And so this list here is just some of those that are available within our Digital Coast website that are related to CCAP data. I'm going to spend a few minutes here going through one example of just highlighting our online land cover atlas tool. And so this is a tool that um, it's online, anyone can go in, they can choose counties or watersheds that may be of interest to them. In this case, I've chosen Charleston County in South Carolina. Um, I guess I'm just biased in that that's where I am currently and so that's where I'm familiar with. Uh, and essentially you're presented with two, two main pieces of information. On the, the right, you're presented a, with a map that highlights all the changes that occurred between 1996 and 2010. Now you can change the time frame to match any of the dates of land cover that we actually map, uh, but right now we're looking at 1996 to 2010. And then on the left-hand side, you're presented with some statistics about the change that occurred. So uh, essentially in Charleston County, what we saw was a little bit more than 7.5% of the county changed in some way, shape, or form 
during that 14-year time period. Uh, we also can highlight the types and distribution of each of those land cover uh, for both time periods as well as changes that occurred in each of those land covers uh, over that time frame. And so here you can see both uh, losses and offsetting gains that occurred in each of, of the land covers that we map. And so while overall there was a, a net loss in terms of upland forest areas that you might see here on the bar chart, uh, you can see that there were also some offsetting gains that occurred during the same time frame. We have a couple of different tabs in the tool so that folks can get a little bit more than just kind of an overview of some of that change. Uh, I've switched over here to the development tab. Uh, now on the map what we're seeing is any new area of development since 1996 highlighted in green. Any area where a development was lost and changed to something else is highlighted in red. And As you might imagine, this is a pretty, a pretty rare kind of change, so you don't see a whole lot of it. Typically it's, it's things like development that may be torn down, areas of, of bare ground before a new development goes up. Um, I don't know if you can kind of tell, but just to the east of downtown Charleston, there's actually a loss right along the top of this bridge. Uh, for anybody who's familiar with the area, we actually used to have two bridges going in and out of downtown Charleston. Uh, they blew those up and built one nice new bridge, and so you actually see the loss of that one bridge showing up in our data. So uh, again, on the left, you have some key statistics. We report the amount of the county that's developed. Uh, we also specifically report the amount of the county that's covered in impervious services. Uh, obviously, that's a key parameter for those of you interested in water quality information. And you can see not only the change in the amount of developed area, but for those areas that were developed, you can take a much closer look at the types of land cover that those areas were before that development occurred. And so here you see a lot of change from upland forest to development during that 14-year period. We have a tab that focuses in on forest change, similar to the other, the other areas, except that we also add a, a component of fragmentation. So you can see not only forest losses, but areas that are categorized as core forests, edges, perforations within the core, and then isolated patches. And then finally, we have some information related to wetlands, similar to the other, the other tabs that we were looking at, areas of wetland loss highlighted in red, any areas of wetland gain are highlighted in green, and we have some statistics that report the overall amount of wetlands in each of the time periods as well as the net change between those two. And again, you can kind of dive in and take a much closer look at the net change in any individual wetland category as well as for the changes that resulted in losses of wetlands, what those losses uh, were attributed to, so what the wetland ended up changing to in the later time frame. Of course, I, I kind of kept that, that overview zoomed out to the entire county, but um, you as a user going into this tool could certainly zoom down in on any area that you may be interested in taking a closer look at and turn the transparency of those change areas on and off so you can get a closer look. And if you find something that might be of real interest to you or somebody that you'd want to share it with, um, we actually have a... Um, a link that you can click on that will give you a custom URL that you can then send to somebody and when they click on that URL the tool will open for them with exactly what you were looking at at the time keyed up so that they can see what you were looking at um, and weigh in if you were asking them for an opinion. And um, you know things being what they are these days we also have access to Facebook and, and Twitter and other social media. And we do have the ability for you to not just see the, this information online, um, but you can click on the print icon that's up there in the right corner and get a nice six-page summary report that goes through all of this information. It provides you a map, and it gives you some background about the data so you can come back and learn more. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass, pass the uh, control of the screen over to Rebecca. And she's going to give you a little bit of an overview into the Digital Coast and that how-to that I mentioned earlier. Great. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Yes. Great. 
Um, okay, yes, my name is Rebecca Love, and thank you, Nate. Um, I'm a coastal management specialist and a member of the CCAP team here at the NOAA Office for Coastal Management. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a product we call a how-to, um, more specifically, it's called how to use land cover as a water quality indicator. Um, but I'm first I'm going to step you through how you can get to this, um, this product. So this is the main um, page for the Digital Coast. You can see on the right there's um, five different products listed. These are usually our top data or tools that are listed here on the right. Um, you can go to the Coastal Change Analysis Program there. You could go through the data link um, or through the data registry. Or you can select Topics, which is what I'm going to do. And that will take you to a page that lists three different topic areas or coastal management issue areas where a number of our resources and products are listed by those different topic areas. So if we go into water quality, um, we can see a list of different tools and data and other information resources that can help you out with water quality issues. The land cover data is this first one under data. So if I select that, um, that will take us to the Coastal Change Analysis Program regional land cover page where the data are available, but you can also scroll down and see several of the different tools that Nate mentioned earlier. So we're going to select the how to use land cover data as a water quality indicator. And that will take us to an Esri story map page. <clears throat> and um, you can open the application. And this is the opening screen for the how to. You can see on the left there are six different steps. Um, these highlight different factors that have influence on water quality. And these are um, the amount of impervious forests, um, developed grasses, and then we'll also look at riparian buffers. On the right-hand side, you can see a map and the extent to where the, um, the data exists. So it's the coastal data um, where the regional sea cap data exists, and that's just for the contiguous U.S. Um, you can zoom in to your area of interest and, and dive in a little bit deeper. Before we get started, I just want to point out if you want more information about the analysis performed for any of the maps or for the data, in here you can click on the little link up there where it says click here to read more about the analysis performed to produce this map. I'm highlighting it in yellow. And that will give you a PDF which just walks you through all the data that's used for this how-to guide and how um, the data were processed. All right, so in the first step, let's take a look at the potential impacts for impervious surface. Um, I've zoomed in here to the northeast. So impervious surfaces are things like concrete and roads and pavement and buildings, and, and they're impenetrable. So they reduce infiltration of water into the ground, and it can result in higher runoff during storms and allow more pollutants to reach water bodies and waterways. Um, we generally see larger amounts of impervious surfaces in areas that have greater impairments to water quality. So the map on the right just shows how much impervious surface there is for that particular watershed um, with lower percentages in the light pale kind of pink color to higher percentages um, in darker red. So you can actually select and click on a watershed unit. Um, these are 12 digit hooks. So for this example, I've selected Charles River near Boston. And you can see that you get some stats here, the total area, the total um, percent impervious, and the area of imper impervious surface. And it's pretty high here, 61% impervious surface here. Um, you can compare that to Great Bay Watershed. Um, in New Hampshire, where there's a lot less impervious surface, just 6%. Um, and generally we see that, oh, excuse me, generally we see that in um, streams that are sensitive, they can be impacted by as little as 10% impervious surface in the watershed. And, and greater impact impairments are um, expected in when rates exceed 20 to 25% impervious surface. So, all right, we'll move on to the next sort of step in this how-to, which looks at the effects of forest cover. Forests are naturally good at absorbing and filtering excess water and pollutants. In urban settings, trees can provide storm water benefits and help reduce costs for water treatment. And forest cover is often one of the best indicators of watershed health. 
Um, watersheds that have more than 65% forest cover have found to be protective of a stream's biological community. And a goal of 40% forest cover is recommended in urban areas. Um, and so you can see we're sticking here to the northeast. Um, the, the legend up here on the right shows you the scale for the percent of forested. Um, if we select a watershed, again, this one is Lower Ipswich River, um, we can see the total area in the percent forest and the amount of forested area in square miles. We'll move on to step three, which really um, helps us take a kind of deeper look at the relationship between impervious surface and forest. And this shows a continuum of the potential impacts between these two types of land cover, where darker green represents healthier watersheds that are largely influenced by forests, while the pink and the red shades show areas that may be sensitive due to large amounts of impervious surface. So when the amount of impervious, impervious surface has kind of exceeded a threshold, it typically becomes the most important factor in determining watershed health. And so sensitive areas that fall sort of in the middle of that, that range, they can be impacted by other factors, maybe agriculture or residential land use practices. Um, so again, we can select one of the watershed units. This was Pocasset River in Rhode Island. Um, and we get the stats again for total area and percent impervious surface and percent forest. Um, for step four, we um, are taking a look at the um, impacts of developed grasses. So um, urban parks and residential open space, they can contribute pollutants like pesticides and nutrients. Um, but if they're managed well, they can also be a sink since they allow for absorption and filtration. And the legend here just shows percent turf cover or developed grasses for this area um, with higher percentages and, and darker kind of a dark brown. Um, and what this is just showing is the difference between the amount of impervious surface and the total amount of developed land cover. And this difference can be a, an indicator of the amount of turf or developed grass. So when we select a watershed unit, in this case, this is the North River, again, we get the total amount of land area, and this time the amount of impervious surface of developed turf grass. Um, let's see, moving to step five. Um, we're going to take a look at the land cover within a 300-foot riparian buffer. Um, riparian zones are often the last line of defense before runoff or pollutants reach a water body. And they're very important for not only um, absorbing water and pollutants, they provide stability to a stream. Um, if we zoom in a little bit more, we can get a better look of the actual, the actual buffers. So you can sort of see the different kind of land cover classes within those buffers. And they're listed there in the um, legend on the right. You can still select a, a watershed and see the actual amount and the percent of each of the land cover types within that riparian buffer for that watershed. Um, some of the different categories are aggregated um, within that. And then the last step um, it just really acknowledges that water quality is very complex and it's um, impacted by many things beyond also um, land cover types. So other things to consider may be um, point and non-point source pollutants, sediments, um, morphology, soil porosity, uh, precipitation, among many other things. And it also provides access to a different tool that's offered within the Digital Coast called Open NSPECT. Um, it's open because it's open sourced. The NSPEC stands for Non-Point Source Pollution and Erosion Comparison Tool. And it provides estimates and maps of surface water runoff volumes, as well as pollutant loads, concentrations, and total sediment loads. Um, the data required for this tool include land cover, elevation, soil, rainfall, and precipitation. So it's available within the Digital Coast. The URL is listed in the bottom there. It's free, open source, and it's GIS based. Um, and it's actually, um, it incorporates established widely used models to predict runoff, pollutants, and erosion. And I just wanted to mention that this tool was used in Wisconsin to prioritize wetland restoration efforts. The Sheboygan County Planning Office used this tool to model surface water runoff and phosphorus loads from different land use scenarios. They were able to take those results and help prioritize restoration 
effort by identifying areas that contribute high levels of runoff and phosphorus, as well as wetlands that have um, potential to provide the most flood abatement and water quality benefits. So that's pretty neat. And that wraps up the how-to. Um, just wanted to mention that the Digital Coast is it's a lot more than a portal to data and tools. Um, there's a strong backing through a diverse partnership among the organizations listed here, and they've played a huge role in shaping and contributing content to improve this resource. So I just want a big thank you to um, all the people in this group and the members who've contributed over the years. And this is the last slide. Thank you very much. Just want to leave you with some URLs to the Digital Coast, on the CCAP data and tools, and there's some emails there if you want to reach out and contact either of us. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, I really appreciate that, Nate and Rebecca. Um, okay. So I was just, I'll just reiterate, uh, now is our question and answer period, so if you have any questions, you can type them in, just send them in the question panel and, and hit send, uh, or you can raise your virtual hand, the little hand icon, and um, you can relay the questions directly to Nate and Rebecca um, that way. So we have a couple, uh, well, we'll start off with one question. Um, one was a comment, I think, it said, wait, what, turf grass is impervious surface, question mark. Uh, I'm not sure if that was um, an so actual question. So um, turf grass is not impervious surface. Um, though I'm not sure exactly what they're asking, but um, the way the developed grasses or turf was um, determined was by taking impervious surface, that area for that um, class, and subtracting it from the total developed classes. So that includes high intensity developed, medium intensity, low, and open space developed. So it's really um, a measure of the amount of open space developed and residential um, kind of grass areas. So okay, great. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> this is Nate, and I I just add that um, you know that that is a category and an indicator that can actually kind of work in in both directions. Um, if those areas of grass are not well managed and there's not um, infiltration capability for the water, they can act as Im impervious surfaces and contribute to runoff. If they are managed well, um, then they can be a great sink for the water that's running off of other areas and really help to mitigate some of the problems that, that could come about from, from a large area of impervious cover. Okay. Great. Thank you, Nate and Rebecca. Um, and we did, okay, let's see, there was a hand raised, but it's gone down. So John, um, who had your hand raised, if you did want to ask a question, um, just go ahead and raise your hand again. Okay, and another question we had come in was, are any of these tools available outside the coastal area? Most of the tools that, that we have are, are developed off of our data, which we only produce in, in the coastal areas. Um, there are some very similar tools. Um, I mentioned we do coordinate with the USGS. Um, they have a tool that functions very much like our land cover atlas, though not on a county by county basis or a watershed basis. They have it set up to run on full states. Um, EPA has uh, a number of tools that focus in on, on water quality as derived from land cover, typically those NLCD products are one that they utilize very heavily. Um, I know they have an environment, Enviro Atlas is one of the tools that, that they've recently come out with that has some very similar kinds of things for the interior parts and the coastal parts of the U.S. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Let's see. And next question. Um, well, I'll just answer a short one. Will this presentation be recorded for review later? And the answer is yes, we are recording. Uh, so if you want a copy of the recording, just uh, send me Sarah underscore Carr at natureserve.org um, an email, and I'll send you the recording once it's posted. Uh, let's see. You use forest cover as an indicator. But what about areas that fall in an ecoregion where forest is not native? Um, forests are generally the, the best um, example as far as absorption, um, but yes, in other areas you know, where forests are not the dominant vegetation, then um, other things would be more important and they would obviously play a role there, but forests were chosen for this how-to because um, they are just 
very effective at absorbing um, water and other pollutants. Okay, great. Thank you, Rebecca. And let's see. Uh, what is the accuracy level and percentage for the products mapped from Landsat? I'm sorry. Could you could you repeat that? Well, I, just in general, could you talk about the accuracy um, in the Landsat mapped products? Sure. So, you know, I mentioned the the resolution that the the products are developed at, and that's 30 meter pixels. So that's a big kind of caveat to the data sets that we produce. These are produced to be a screening level analysis over um, states and, and regional geographies, not at very, very local level, beyond that screening level. It kind of gives you an idea of where to look, but you need to look a little bit closer um, if you're trying to make a very site-specific decision. Now, the, the products that we produce, we do have a, an accuracy spec that they are at least 85% accurate overall. Um, and a lot of that accuracy or the error maybe that's involved in that is really in between some of the more um, subtle differences in the categories. So, you know, most of the error that exists is between whether we map uh, an evergreen forest as evergreen or whether we call it mixed forest. Um, far less of the error is, is related to whether or not it, it should be a, a completely unrelated category. And all the, I should mention, all the, the accuracy information is something that you download along with the metadata that comes down with the data sets. Okay, great. Thank you, Nate. Um, what is the latest product for the U.S. Virgin Islands? Yeah, that's a that's a softball question. I, I owe somebody some money. The um, the Virgin Islands is one of our more recently updated high res products, and so we just released. Um, I think it was about a month ago. 2012 data for all three of the Virgin Islands, and those that's an update to existing 2007 and 2002 data sets that we had there. And so that's actually the, the one high-res geography where we have now three time periods and, and two change products that are available. Okay, fantastic. I think you've probably made somebody happy. Okay, are any of the tools linked to educational materials such as labs, classroom activities, et cetera, that could be used in the classroom? If so, where, where could we find these? Yeah, that's a great question. There, there is on um, the CCAP regional page, there is in our supporting documents and resources section a um, lesson plan that NOAA developed. It's a number of years old now. Um, but the, the ideas in it still hold true, uh, and so that's probably the most direct resource. Um, other than that, uh, we uh, do not have a lot of lesson plans and things that we've developed al around the data. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nate. Um, do your data sets extend to Canadian coastal regions? No. I'm sorry. They do not. Um, you know, being a, a U.S. federal agency, we, we get paid to map the U.S. coastal areas, not, not anywhere outside of the U.S. Um, we have had a number of conversations with um, a few of the, the provinces and their, their Ministry for Natural Resources, but nothing that's really resulted in, in any work yet, though there's been a lot of talk and, and I think some interest. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. I've, this is the question. I've read or heard these online apps are built using open source technologies. Could you name them and is NOAA's code base open source for others to build off of or are just the technologies open source? Thanks. Yeah, so that's uh, maybe a little bit outside of my, my area of expertise, so I'll, I'll do what I can. Um, some of it is open source, some of it is not. Um, you know, obviously the the how-to and the story maps that, that we show, those are ESRI technology, so that's not necessarily open source, but the, um, the map services that we produce behind the scenes um, are accessible to anyone who can suck those in and make, make use of those. Um, the 
the land cover atlas tool that we produced is um, code that our developers here worked on. Um, and we have had instances in the past where we've been more than willing to share that with anybody who wanted to try to take that and, and do something a little bit more customized for their own their own areas. You know, and then um, Rebecca certainly talked to Enspect, which is built on an open source platform. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. We don't have any other questions right now. So if anybody wants a question asked, you've got a couple seconds. Um, and I just wanted to go ahead and, and thank Rebecca and Nate. This was a great presentation, and we had a great turnout. And um, we really appreciate everyone uh, coming here today. And um, well, actually, we do have a hand raised. Oh, let me see. I'll, I'll just check and see if this person. Hey, Marlene? Marlene, did you want to ask a question? Okay. Okay, I don't think that was real. But anyway, um, thank you guys. We really appreciate you being here today. It was a great presentation, and uh, yeah, I think you, you did a great job answering the questions at the end, too. Um, so your contact information is there for anyone who wants to get in touch. <coughs> and um, I guess we'll just say good afternoon to everyone. And so it, if you guys had any wrap-up you wanted to, any wrap-up information you wanted to give. I, I just say thanks for the time. I appreciate everybody showing up. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you in a future webinar. Bye.